Now we would like to transition into the first panel of the day. So allow me to introduce um, this panel. For capacity development in cybersecurity, uh, Dr. Bright Gamedi, who is the cybersecurity lead for Maya. Dr. Bright Kadukisana. And also allow me to invite Anthony Moyoro, who is the Associate Director, Cybersecurity KPMG East Africa. Uh, Anthony Karubi Sanam. Uh, and uh, the moderator for our session will be Linda Dishori Karubi Linda. Thank you. So again, this will be a panel on the capacity development in cybersecurity. If you have questions, please drop them down so that we ask them at the end. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're doing fine. Thank you, neighbor. And so the good business is yes. <laughs> that was just the beginning. Okay. Uh, so our session today is going to be on cyber capacity building in cyber security. Our, es yes. uh, our esteemed panelists are Dr. Bright Gamini, a cyber security lead at Maya. We also have Fesha Kiondo, a cyber security engineer, who is also an information security engineer and a mentor at Tech Startup. So I'm just going to give them a chance to introduce themselves, to tell us more about what they do, and then we're going to head to the questions. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. I believe everyone has had something to eat, right? Uh, so my name is Afrisa Kilonzo, uh, cybersecurity community lead here in Kenya, uh, running a community called Hack the Box Kenya, and uh, part of the Africa Hakon uh, community. I'm also a cyber security engineer at uh, CyberCat Africa. I'm a cyber security mentor at uh, Texas Nairobi. Uh, for those who don't know about Texas, Texas is more of a hub, uh, startup hub, whereby guys go and uh, come up with new ideas, new developments within 54 hours. Uh, and uh, I help in terms of uh, mentoring terms of cyber security and uh, keeping guidance on matters of cyber security. Hello. The last time I heard him ever introduce himself, it used to be one line. <laughs> this is good too. So funny enough, we've never been on a panel together because either I'm the one presenting or he's representing me. So it's, it's quite interesting to be on the same panel. Let me get close up here. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so my name is Bright. Um, I'm a cyber security leader at a company called Mara, which is to deal with those with blockchain and um, cryptocurrencies, but it's more blockchain that we look at. Um, so I work there as a cyber security lead trying to build a layer two chain, which we have actually built. I'm also the founder of Africa Hackon, um, the CEO of Cyberguard Africa. He's the only employer I have. <laughs> but uh, we do have a lot of work that we do. Um, I'm also a lecturer at Strathmore University. I'm a part of a few of the technical board of directors for a few companies like Moringa School. You all know EC Council? Yeah, EC Council for Cybersecurity. I'm also, also part of the board of directors, technical board of directors for the threat intelligence. And um, yeah, a few other things. I don't know. <laughs> I think that's just about me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And welcome to the Kenya Youth Internet Governance Forum. So I'm just going to take the question. Uh, what are some of the key cybersecurity threats and challenges faced by the Kenyan youth? And how can capacity development programs help them navigate and mitigate this risk? Um, so, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> can, you can start. One of the biggest challenges is uh, for guys getting resources uh, and also getting into spaces whereby they are able to learn how can I be able, especially me for cyber security, how can I be able to learn about cyber security? Majority of the places you check out online are quite expensive, damn expensive. 
And uh, for me, I'm a product of free online learning. As long as I have internet, no matter what machine, I've taught myself cyber security from second year campus. Uh, yeah, from second year campus, all, the, all through, and each day is a learning day, even as I work, each day is a learning day. So, going online, there are so many free resources online, there are so many free tools online. As long as you have the will and uh, mindset that you want to learn, you will most definitely get all the resources, getting friends who are in the spaces, getting people who are in the spaces, getting mentorship. So many guys are quite uh, quote unquote, if I can call it lazy. Uh, why do I say lazy? Because uh, some of the guys who approach me and approach Dr. Bright, yes, they want to learn about cyber security. But the first task when it comes to learning about cyber security is have you done research? Majority have not done research. And uh, if you give them the, that, uh, to go and do research and come back with something that will show them, that will show their interest, then there's nothing. So I think that skill gap, that uh, will, the yeah. want to learn more about the uh, various parts, not just the specific, but various parts. You asked about risk, right? Um, no. So there are so many risks that the youth get exposed to. Right now, information is so available that it's very easy for you to be able to actually get exposed to anything and everything. Um, back in the day, when I started learning cybersecurity, I was pretty young. Um, I was eight, nine, ten years old, thereabouts. Don't guess my age, relax. Yeah. <laughs> and at that time, most of the websites you go to are pornographic websites. Because when you actually want to learn any kind of technology, they actually bring such things. So, you see, I was able to refrain from that because I know how to with data. So now, if you can imagine, there's so many Telegram groups, WhatsApp groups, Instagram groups that can try to bring you to such things. And the risk that poses is that you are actually getting exposed to some of the negative aspects of things as well. I've seen so many people who try to get into cybersecurity, and the first thing they look for is what? Hacking, right? And cybersecurity is way beyond the whole hacking um, kind of lifestyle. So that's some of the risks that I see, and I think some of the capacity development programs that we see is being able to make sure that they learn the right way, get access to free resources, but the right resources as well, to be able to make sure that you actually learn the right way, and be able to actually avoid some of those um, exposures that you actually potentially get to get um, to. Yeah. So when you look at the Kenyan youth right now, most of the things that we lack, and that's a, a thing I feel from Koreans, is that this guy's research, they read and then they can actually bring back and say, I've tried this, mentor me. But if you come with empty hands and say, teach me and talk to the school fed, trust me, you will never ever be able to get anywhere. Just to add on to what Greta said, also aggressiveness, how aggressive I the youth in terms of wanting to learn more, wanting to gain more from what is out there, wanting to understand how do things work, not just being of the mindset of hacking, Cyber security is all about hacking. There's so much more to cyber security than hacking. Because if you don't understand how things are working, if you don't go and do the research, do the reading, then you won't be able to understand the various uh, methodologies, policies, procedures, and what is meant to happen within the cyber security. Um, you've talked about the Korean education system. So how can the education system in Kenya incorporate cyber security awareness and skill development in the curriculum so as to empower and prepare the youth for the evolving digital landscape. We, we have seen that the digital era is actually continuing, it's expanding, it's just evolving by each day. So how, what are the areas you think the education system in Kenya can improve? I think I'll start and then I'll let Fraser take it from a different perspective, knowing that he just completed school. <laughs> so. I find a very big gap with our lecturers and the people who are in the various faculty in the universities in Kenya. Majority of them don't even want to think about the fact that we need to start changing the curriculum or the structure of how we actually do education in Kenya, right? So some of the lecturers, trust me, have not read anything new in the last four years. Mm -hmm. I, I keep, I'm a lecturer, so I know. 
I, I lecture at Strathmore. I lecture for five courses at Strath in the master's class. And when I hear some of the other students telling me things that they are getting from other lecturers from other universities, or whenever I go for workshop, you can tell these lecturers are not learning anything new. That's the gap number one. Gap number two, the faculties they want to sit down and be able to interrogate the progress or the programs that they have and the outcome of the students. Too many theoretical lectures, we need to have practicality. Let me tell you something. If you ever go to Strathmore University and you do my master's class, I don't do in-person exams. I don't care where you do the exam from. Do it from where, it can be in Mount Kenya, do the exam from there. I never ever have students in the classroom seated and they say, start, and then you start cramming and writing down answers. I, I knew, in my classes, you'll never. My classes are practical. You have to present what you've researched on. You have to present what you've actually put together for a long time. If it's a, high, if it's a, if it's a cyber security pen test and exam, you will have to basically, basically, I'll give you three hours, I'll give you scenarios, you have to break into systems which are live, which are set up though. So I like the practicality, and that's something we're missing. We are not incorporating practical sessions or practical details into our curriculum. We are focused too much on theoretical aspects of things, and the lecturers are not upskilling themselves to read something new to come teach the students. So if the lecturer does not do that, what happens to the students? They also don't go to do practical things. I've been a guest lecturer at so many universities, and that's a gap I see. They are still doing theory, and we have computers, we have resources, we have labs, we have unlimited storage, we have the digital transformation that we've gone through recently with COVID, the, with the pandemic, should have actually alerted people that we can actually study things online. So why are we not being able to take that? Because of who? The leadership. From a learner's perspective, and uh, I think I saw one or two people who went to, we were in the same university. So I'm, I'm a research graduate, just graduated last year, December. And uh, one of the things that really missed out, yes, I did do an uh, IT related course, but did it have the IT practicality? No. Did it have theoretical, theoretical stuff? Yes. Was it in that? No. Is it something I can apply outside? No. Would I self-teach myself? Yes. So when you're looking at it, how can the government, how can uh, the various learning institutions upskill in terms of help us grow? Not just teaching us the theoretical aspect, as Dr. Prater said, but teach us more of the practicality. How can we practice this, even as we prepare to go out to the market and uh, work out there? How can we be able to use whatever we are learning? Yes, you saw the government using up to programming, assist in terms of skill code. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I don't think even the lecturers need to learn how to code. I don't, I don't care if they have to code because we have ChatGPT that can do that for you right now. I don't care if the lecturers don't know how to be able to do some of the practical hacking skills, but they should be able to know the avenues that they can actually guide the students to go do stuff. I am not the best when it comes to hacking, but I can guide somebody and tell you there's a mistake somewhere and go learn something. For, by basically getting accessible resources, right? And that's the gap which we are finding. So yes, let me say some, some lecturers are lazy. No offense. Right or wrong? Yeah, some of them are lazy. They don't want to do any kind of extra research. That's why we are always good to have that gap. When I was in South Korea, my master's class, every Korean student was a Python programmer. Not just a basic Python programmer, a really good Python programmer. Now look at Bright. This is me spending all the night trying to read to become <laughs> as good as them. But I can't be as good as them in such a short time. You so, so I think it's basically the way we have to structure, but it starts from the faculties, being able to tweak a few things here and there, um, and uh, make a few changes, yeah. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you said that point. I think it's very important. Not only in cybersecurity, in most of our courses, they need, uh, we need to have a more practical approach. Uh, as Kenyans, you say, Kwagang, Vitu will be different, yeah? VKG. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, what are the potential career paths and opportunities available in the field of cybersecurity for young people in Kenya, and how can they be encouraged to pursue this path? That was his first presentation when I put him on the stage and I told him he had to present to, 
to high schoolers. <laughs> there are so many opportunities in the cybersecurity space, and I can tell you for free, there's money in it. I'm not going to tell you how my, what, my, what my salary is, but there is money in cybersecurity. There is so many opportunities, and it doesn't have to be technical. Most people think when cybersecurity, you have to be a hacker. No. I know people who are actually technical writers. I know people who actually do policies and governance and compliance. That's just reading, being able to understand and then implement them. I know people who actually um, are advisors when it comes to cybersecurity. I know people who are forensic engineers, who are, or oh, sometimes they're forensic analysts. So they don't have to necessarily do the core, method, the core technical aspect of things. However, it's always good to do the bare minimum technical basis. That's a way, which is basic programming and the like. So the job market is open. There's a huge gap when it comes to cybersecurity skill set. That's what Africa Hackon has been trying to do for a very long time. When I founded this about 10 years ago, all I wanted to do is to teach young people cybersecurity. And that's what we'll still keep on doing. We have monthly meetups. It's been going on and off for some time, but it's back. So look out for, for them on the Africa Hackon pages on Twitter or Instagram or wherever it is, or you follow me. We will keep sharing those. So the availability of those kind of, of and the thing is, you can't be a cybersecurity engineer and still apply it to a different aspect of work when it comes to data science or analytics or any kind of thing. I that skill set that I had from cybersecurity made it to become a CTO at the point in time, and I was able to actually get to interrogate what other people are doing. Because if you are a cybersecurity engineer, you need to understand code. You don't necessarily have to know how to write code. I'm a horrible code coder, by the way. Trust me. I'm terrible at coding, but I understand code and I can read code and I can break code. So being able to understand code, you understand product management. I know people who are product managers in cybersecurity. I know people who are making a ton of money being cybersecurity sales people. They get paid a lot of money and not just local. I'm talking about international sales people. Uh, yeah. So, that's basically what I can say uh, in terms of the fact that the availability of, of, of uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of opportunities. Yeah, and just to mention, apart from just being in cybersecurity, you can apply it wherever, as uh, Dr. Freitas has mentioned. One of uh, our mentees was a fully fledged medical doctor. Guy Quit is meant to buy job as being a medical doctor and became a cybersecurity engineer within the medical field. So you see, you can, apply it. Yeah. you can apply it wherever you want to. So it doesn't matter if you're probably even a pilot. Have a look at how cybersecurity affects, uh, incorporates within the airline uh, business and the airline world. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe I could ask uh, from the audience, how many here are cybersecurity? Excess students? Um, thinking about doing, uh, getting into cyber security. So you can just, program? Yes. Yeah. Anything to do cyber security? Yes. Uh, so as you, as you've seen, there's a lot of opportunity. The future is digital. So maybe we can ask them what are some of the initiatives and programs that uh, someone who's interested in joining in getting into cyber security, where do they start with? Where do they start at? Cyber Girls program, yeah, all right, some of them. Okay, so I'm part of what's talking about the Cyber Safe Foundation, which um, targets young women in cyber security. Look for Cyber Girls program. The next cohort, I don't know when it started, but yeah. So that Cyber Girls program, there are some of them who are here, alumni, and, and the likes to talk to them. Um, be able to actually join that. You can also look at some of the Africa Hackle programs that we have. We, we usually do master classes for like two days. Look out for that. But let me tell you the easiest way to get into cyber security. Google. The internet. It's right there. Check out cyberry.it. Check out Hack the Box, the Hack the Box um, as one of them. Uh, check out Try Hack Me. They all have courses and programs that can let you practice cyber security in a very safe environment. Um, but learn basic programming. And I'm talking basic programming of HTML, CSS, PHP. You can get that from freecodecamp.org. Get to that place. I should be typing this so that it makes my life easier. Uh, freecodecamp.org gives you access to all of these details. You will be able to get all of those resources for free. 
And I'll show you one way right now uh, so that we can actually see how to get access to those resources. But there, is, there are numerous, if you think we should go to Udemy, there are courses that are there. If you check, um, there are too many resources out there, but the guidance is what you're looking for. Cybrary.it is one of the easiest ways that I like to start with because it's very guided, it helps you to understand the terminologies, helps you to understand the various elements of cybersecurity. This ISC squared also has a cybersecurity program. Cisco has a cybersecurity program. Check all of those. Excuse me, fundamentals that you can actually use to get into it. Then from there, you can go to the other try hack me or hack the box where it gets a little bit more technical or hands-on. And guess what? All of these are free. Please don't pay for things immediately. <laughs> They're free. Google now has a cybersecurity program. I think Kenya is part of the list where it's actually totally free, right? So you can. Other programs are, are for example, Cybershooter, uh, which basically tries to link uh, to fill in that skill gap, especially for guys who just completed our uh, campus and are uh, looking for jobs within the cybersecurity space. I uh, about three, four months program, very intensive. Once you're done with it, uh, you can be able to look for jobs. Moringa School also started a cybersecurity program. Hack the Box, being that I'm the lead for Hack the Box Kenya in East Africa. Uh, Hack the Box has Hack the Box Academy, which is 50-50 free and also paid for. But that's for if you want to get hands on you with your machine and learn, learn as you go. We hold meetups every single week on Fridays at night after work hours so that guys go through technical sessions from around 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. So many guys from 17 year olds teaching guys who are working to guys who are working coming in and sharing their understanding of cyber security and uh, how guys can be able to leverage on various uh, items. Yeah. Also check out eCrowd. E K R A L. The E Crowd Innovation Hub actually pays you to study cybersecurity. It's a government program which actually they take about 60 people per cohort. For six months, they teach you various cybersecurity programs. I don't know if it's, I think it's still running. Um, so check out when the cohort, the next cohort is. They actually pay you to become a cybersecurity engineer. And then if you pass, they can deploy you to any of the government offices, which is not bad. Don't worry, government office are not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some of them who've been deployed to the central bank, to Kenya Revenue Authorities, and trust me, there's a lot of work to be done there. Pretty interesting, actually. Uh, in terms of uh, just there are some government websites, there are some companies that have been hacked. What is what? What are you going to talk? About? What are you going to advise on that? And what are the opportunities that the youth can tap into to be able to help solve this issue? Learn to hack them more. <laughs> Simple as that. I think some people don't want to wake up until they actually get to the compromise. And you'll see that in the very past, in the recent past, some of these government systems or private sectors, they have the budget to be able to, to actually do security, but they don't employ that. Do you know why? They just don't think it's a priority until they get compromised. Ransomware attacks have grown in the, in the recent past, and the reason why, and, and that's changed. Before it used to be, they take over your computers or servers and, and encrypt all the files and tell you to pay. This time, they steal the files and tell you to. They steal the files and tell you, if you don't pay, we will expose them. Today, we actually have seen about five other people who have been compromised in Kenya, very big organizations, and they said the data is on the internet for, it's in a dark web, on a deep web for sale. Now, the sale of those, I'll give a typical example. Kenya Airports Authority was compromised some time back, right? When they were hacked, 500 gigabytes worth of data has been leaked. And if you go to that data properly, you possibly could be able to actually print out your badge for airport to move through around like you are a very big boss. What do you think that will be the implication? Anyone? What is? Security breaches, exactly. That's, that, that's national security. Terrorist attack would now have access to know how the plan of the, of the Kenya airports look like. So, I would say become an ethical hacker to do responsible disclosures. We do responsible disclosures all the time. There is that ethical part of things, so learn how to hack, learn how to be a cybersecurity engineer, but please do it ethically. 
Safaricom is the only company right now in Kenya that has what we call a bank bounty program where they allow you to legally hack them if you join the program and be able to actually get paid for it. They've paid up more than 10 million Kenya shillings so far. A lot. So Kenyans are actually making money every day as their day-to-day -day job hacking Safaricom, but legally when you join the program. So I, I will encourage more people to come out to become more cybersecurity engineers. If you don't know how to get it to the people who you hacked, call me. Find me on Twitter. Find me anywhere. Let me know. I'll connect you to somebody in that company. There has to be a way to get to any of them. Thank you so much. Uh, I, you have heard from him, learn how to hack, ethical hacking. So, what are some of the emerging trends and technologies in the cyber security landscape, and how can capacity development programs adapt to address the evolving challenges and opportunities for cross-border knowledge sharing? I think uh, currently looking at how tech is evolving, uh, introduction of things like AI, production of things like uh, blockchain, how can you grow into such spaces as a cyber security engineer, how can you get into such spaces uh, as a cyber security engineer, not just revolving around the cyber security circles alone, but also getting into other circles, understanding how does AI work, how can you leverage an AI in terms of cyber security, how can you leverage on blockchain, how can you use your skills to affect uh, such things. What are some of the, how can mentorship programs and partnerships between established cyber security professionals like you um, and young aspiring individuals contribute to the capacity development in the field? How can the mentorship programs between established cyber security professionals and young aspiring individuals contribute to the capacity development in this field? So I'll try and keep that short because I, I want questions from the audience more than us talking. Um, but we do have a lot of partnerships that we run when it comes to Africa Hackathon, but we like representatives from the various schools or institutions to take the initiative. I mean, we get really busy, so there's only so much we can do. But when we have to go to be the one to hand for all of these programs, it becomes quite difficult, right? And also, we want to make it as much as that people, if you have the representative who can encourage the teams of various people in their universities or high schools or whatever it is to read a lot and to come together and become one from the WhatsApp groups and everything, then we can help. But if we don't have that kind of initiative from themselves, it becomes quite difficult for us to be able to actually add value. Yeah. I'm a product mentorship, and uh, I'm glad to be sitting with my mentor. And uh, one of the things that mentorship really has is it guides you, your mentor will guide you, your mentor is too busy to teach you, but your mentor is there to guide you. Is there to give you a way and show you this is the path, this is uh, the trend, this is the direction you can follow. This is the old direction, don't follow it, follow this other direction. So being able also for the ones who are yearning to get mentorship, reach to their mentors and having that mentor-mentee relationship Majority of guys think uh, because of the next is my team, or we are, we are more than a mentor, mentor and mentee. But the moment you get into such a relationship with your mentor or mentee, there's that, there's boundaries, yes, but you will learn a lot once you get a mentor. Yeah. I'm, very, I'm very picky when it comes to my mentorship. When I get a, mentor, a mentee and I try to guide and they don't follow the instructions for one or two weeks and they don't get the plan, I will tell you point blank. This relationship is done. And I, I'm very candid about it because I don't want to fall. I don't, want to, I don't have time. I have so, he knows my entire calendar. Even I can't book meetings this day by myself. If he doesn't book my meetings, that meeting is not happening. If he did not book for this meeting today, this was not going to happen. If he did not have the keys today with him right now in the car, I would have left a long time ago because of time. So that kind of a thing has to be, you need to be able to make sure that you have a mentor who, I mean, a men, be a mentee or work with a mentor who can actually work with you. Sometimes if your mentor is too busy and you can't have a good relationship, then simply walk away. I mean, there are so many others that are out there. So 
getting to be picky with the mentees or the mentors has to be a decision you have to make. I chose him for the fact that of how resilient he is. I go with him to every single meeting. Why? Because I want him to learn the way I talk, the way I do things, the way I do business as well. And also, I'm teaching him to be able to actually run the company without me being there. If a company cannot run without me being there for at least four days or five days, then the company is not sustainable. But the thing is, you know what? It actually runs without, without me being there. So this is not Cyber, this is not Mara, this is CyberGuard Africa, <laughs> okay? So basically, I was able to actually stick with him for a long time. I have other mentees which I still work with. Some of them come back to me, others go quiet. And when they go quiet, it gets to the point I tell you, I'm sorry, but I have to cut this relationship and I'm very, very clear about it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, this is the last question before we head over to the questions. Um, in terms of uh, the government, the academia, the CSOs, what role can the government, academia, and the industry play in providing accessible and inclusive capacity development opportunities in cybersecurity for the Kenyan youth? Which just make it easy for Kenyan youth to get into the system. There are too many bureaucracies. They're asking for, for two years' experience, for, for, I don't know, I mean, he just finished, he or she just finished school. You know? <laughs> I get so annoyed when I see such programs where they're asking uh, somebody who is on the entry level, cyber security engineer, but they're asking for a certified ethical hacker. Why? This person did not, did not even have the money to be able to actually do that course. But the thing is, let me tell you something. Go do all of these free courses, beef up your CV with the free courses. Sometimes that is even more powerful. I was so happy when Central Bank some time back was looking for the data analysts and say, we don't, we don't care if we have a degree or not, right? So being able to be given a chance is what I think most organizations need to do, rather than having those blockage of being asking for re, uh, years of experience. But how would you ever get, let me tell you something, some of these youth who are really good at cybersecurity or even have the bare minimum knowledge are better than the people who have been there working for like five years. I kid you not. But if they don't get the chance to be able to learn how to go up the corporate ladder, how are we ever going to change? Because we'll, we'll keep on having gatekeepers. It doesn't help. Yeah. So the chance that's all I, I can say. Terms of being uh, assisting us, uh, especially for us, we need to be assisted. Give us uh, boot camps give us hackathons that are practical and that are real and that will assist us in terms of this uh, This is the government supporting us to learn the ropes in, uh, when it comes to cyber security, giving us the opportunities to get those jobs within the opportunities that are, they've uh, assisted us in terms of learning. So the opportunities, they should be there. They should be, they need to also guide us. When it comes to getting jobs, I think I quit looking for a job because I couldn't just get a job because I don't have the certification. So I stopped looking for a job completely because they're looking for quite expensive uh, certifications. I think this is one of the inter uh, companies that I applied for. The list of certifications they were looking for, even a person who's done five years does not have all those certifications. And they go around and still come back to here for an interview. All of them. They, they, they keep on calling him back for interviews that like, we still need you, but they don't keep on hiring. I told him, look, stop looking for a job. Let's work together. But I pray a day will come where people who are managers in organizations will stop being managers and become mentors to let people come and also help them go up the road. If I, look, for the fact that I get him to work with me, I also elevate, you know? But if I'm being one of these, what you Kenyan call kitchen gumu, right? And I say it right? Yeah, and then you say you want to be the only manager. You cannot keep, you cannot be the best in that particular field forever. You have to go another level. You need to let somebody take over. But if you want to be at the same technical person forever, you will never grow. It's just a part of life. And I hope that we, one day we'll get the people to change. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bates, family, and Joseph Lundo. We're going to end this session. Uh, I'm just going to ask for a few questions and then we close it for the next session. One or two, three.
There's a question at the corner. Um, and as we do that, everyone else who has a question, please write it down and we will end for now in a minute or two. Okay. Hi, thank you so much. I think you have touched on so many things that I'm really passionate about. My name is Jackie Kimani. I'm a consultant with Watoto Watch Network. And I'm also, a, um, I think I'm the most addicted person on, on the internet because I learn everything and let my brain choose which path to take. Uh, you have spoken about not having proper credentials, but being able to do the job. I want to bring it up to another level. What about people who do not have the papers and they're awesome managers and they're leading teams that are doing great stuff, especially in this country, where every, everywhere you go, you are asked for your papers. How do we break that gap onto the next ceiling, especially for self-taught managers and creators within this uh, ecosystem? Uh, tech design business, I put them as three because they are in interweb for some reason. So how do we break that ceiling and allow or bring up self-taught managers just as you mentee here? There are younger people who are younger, younger there are people who are younger than me who have way more certifications than me, but don't earn even half of what I do. Okay, or don't have that exposure. You need to show your work. You need to actually put yourself out there. A few year, a few months ago, Fraser was not a person you can ever think of when you look at cybersecurity. But right now, when you try to look for cybersecurity on LinkedIn or wherever it is, and you see his name, he's actually for somebody who's known. Somebody who can actually go to boardrooms and speak. You need to show your work. And showing your work, I mean, go to places, talk about what you're doing. Be a person to be able to do lead conversations and panel discussions or presentations, even if it's five, ten minutes. There's a presentation that I'm doing tomorrow. I'm only giving 11 minutes to speak. And that, trust me, that alone is an impact. And you know what I do after that? I'm going to write about it on LinkedIn and say, this was a conversation that happened at this place. This is what we discussed. This is how it went. And this is what I do. What I, what I talked about. I personally like to document every presentation that I do. So after this, I go on LinkedIn, add this another one. Yeah? And guess what? Such conversations get to drive to people to come to you. When I was walking on stage right now, somebody sent a message on LinkedIn. I like your profile and I can see that you've done a lot of presentations for us in South Africa. Do you mind coming to lead a cybersecurity session? It came just when I was walking here. I said physical or virtual, they said physical. I'm like, yes, I have to travel, you know? <laughs> and this is somebody who I have never seen before. She actually just connected with me on LinkedIn when I was at the back, when I was back there talking to you. Just now, why? Because you are seeing my past. The LinkedIn algorithm has all of that ability to be able to push you to people who actually get to know about your work because of keywords. You are the key hashtag. So don't keep, people like to hide what they're doing. No, go write about it. Even two lines. Critique things that you've seen so that those things become your certifications. Me, I see people being hacked online and everything. I go write an article about to say, this was the news on business daily. This is what I think should be done by people in the government or private sector or individuals. Secure yourself by doing one, two, three, four. Five, ten lines, I'm done. That will stay there forever. The algorithm will push you to people who will get interested and you'll keep on calling you for presentations. And let me tell you something, it's phase. So that should be your CV. You don't necessarily have to do all the certifications. I'm not discouraging you from certifications. Please do them when you can, before you get old. <laughs> Trust me. When babies get involved, there's no time. So if you can't do those certifications, the free ones, the paid ones, um, just get to do them. Yeah. But your public speaking, your excuse me, your engagement in the youth or wherever it is, with the Watoto Watch and document them. Put them on places like LinkedIn, on Twitter, do a thread. It goes far. Thank you so much, Dr. Bert Kameli, who is a cybersecurity lead at Mara. We had Faisa Kilonzo, a cybersecurity engineer and information security engineer. Um, I am myself moderating the session. I'm Linda Kicholi. I'm a legal tech representing Kicksonet and the Kenya Youth IGF. Thank you.